Thanks for joining us for this symposium. I'm Bill Rapisi, President and CEO of the Lymphatic Education Research Network. Lauren's mission is to fight lymphatic diseases through education, research, and advocacy. In order to win a fight, you first have to join it. So we ask, please become a supporting member of LEARN at lymphaticnetwork.org. And we hope you enjoy today's symposium. Hello, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. This is Peter Mortimer speaking from London, UK. It's my pleasure to be able to deliver uh, a lecture in the online symposium series for LEARN. The title of my talk is Primary Lymphedema, How Science Has Changed Patient Care. This is me, third from the left, and I'm introducing myself as a failed tennis player. No, seriously, this is just a bit of fun to start with. I love my tennis. And uh, this is me playing on centre court at Wimbledon because Roger Federer and all his fellow players uh, were not there. Uh, this is last year and it was a, a, a total privilege. And when I'm not playing tennis, uh, I'm a dermatologist by training. And it was pretty well 40 years ago that I first became interested in lymphatics and lymphedema. And that has a story as well, because I was training as a dermatologist in Oxford. And my boss at the time said, uh, Peter, he said, have you ever thought of doing some research? And I said, well, yes, I've thought about it. He said, have you ever thought about doing lymphatics? And I said, no. And he said, well, I think you should, because I guarantee in two years you'll be a world expert. Well, I puffed out my chest um, and thought, thank goodness my new boss thinks so highly of my ability. But it was nothing to do with that, uh, because what he meant was if you're the only one working on lymphatics, it's not difficult to become a world expert. And therein lies the problem is having uh, medical professionals interested in the lymphatic system and lymphedema. And I have to declare that I have no disclosures other than being a failed tennis player. Anyway, on to the matter in hand. So uh, why is lymphedema not on the radar of doctors? Uh, many patients uh, uh, who are listening will relate to this, that they often find the doctors say, I don't know anything about lymphedema, and lymphedema is rarely uh, a proactive diagnosis. It's usually main, made by exclusion. And if a doctor knows about lymphedema, it's usually because it's cancer related, such as breast cancer related lymphedema, or they might have heard of a condition called elephantiasis, uh, which is just lymphedema, but lymphedema that's developed as a result of an infection contracted from a mosquito bite. So that's very much lymphedema within a tropical uh, country. But other forms of lymphedema, and particularly primary lymphedema, I doubt will, uh, will rarely be uh, actually positively diagnosed by a doctor. And this is because it's not, it doesn't feature on the medical curriculum uh, or uh, the curriculum of other professionals allied to medicine, and that has to change. So what is lymphedema? Well, quite simply, lymphedema is a common disease. You might say how common, but uh, there are data to show that actually it's very common indeed. All forms of lymphedema, very common, not necessarily primary lymphedema is a common disease which manifests with swelling and a predisposition to infections. Now, lymphedema most commonly presents as swollen ankles, as you can see in the picture, and I guarantee lymphedema would never be thought of if that person presented like that. Lymphedema occurs when the lymphatic system doesn't work properly. So I need to tell you a little bit about the lymphatic system, and then I'll come back to the next point about chronic edema. So the lymphatic system 
is the uh, body's uh, return system. So you've all heard of the blood circulation, the heart pumping the blood around, but many people, unless they have interested in lymphatics, will not necessarily have heard of the lymphatic system. And the lymphatic system's function is to cleanse and drain the body tissues, as well as being a recycling route for fluid and immune cells. So in the tissues of the body, uh, it's fairly simple that the blood supplies oxygen, nutrients, water, and the tissues and the cells of the body utilize that. But then what they throw out or don't need needs draining. And that's basically what the lymphatic system is for. Uh, and so the lymphatic system consists of a, a one way drainage system and lymph is the fluid within it connected to lymphoid organs. So lymphoid organs, that's the where the uh, the houses, the immune cells. So lymph glands are one example. And the main function of the lymphoid organs is in host defense. Now, I don't want to get too complicated, but I just need to explain a little bit more. And the reason for having to explain a little bit more is forms of primary lymphedema vary according to where the fault in the lymph drainage system is. So uh, you've often seen pictures of the, of the cardiovascular system. Well, here, if you can see my cursor moving, uh, you'll see in green lymphatic vessels draining peripheral tissues, but lymphatic vessels also drain central organs. And we basically have two types of lymphatic vessel, the small lymphatic capillary, which is a blind ending or bud-like structure, which is absorbing. It absorbs material and fluid into it. And once in, it's called lymph. And then the lymph fluid is transported down a network of ever increasingly sized channels to the lymph glands, underarms, groin, and, and centrally as well. And these initial lymphatics, these absorbing lymphatics, I think of somewhat like uh, tentacles on sea anemones or sea sponges that absorb material and then transport them downstream. So if we go to the thumb here, you'll see a network of initial lymphatics that then drain into bigger lymph vessels. And then the main lymph vessels down the uh, limb are the ones that contain smooth muscle, they've got uh, red smooth muscle around them, and they have valves to make sure the flow of the lymph is one direction. And eventually all lymph discharges back into the blood circulation, into the uh, great veins of the neck. Uh, and then from the blood, of course, uh, it's reoxygenated, refed, and then uh, the blood supplies the peripheral tissues once again, and that's where the circulation is complete. So I will come back to this picture because it's important for understanding different mechanisms in different forms of primary lymphedema. But before I go on to primary lymphedema, I just want to come to this point about chronic edema uh, because chronic edema is not really any different from lymphedema. But the extraordinary thing is chronic edema, people know, doctors recognize chronic edema or edema where you can uh, put a thumb into the tissue and leave a bit of a pit. They understand that's fluid retention, but what they don't recognize is that when that fluid retention issue is because the lymphatic system is not working properly, uh, it's called lymphedema. But any chronic edema means that there is some problem in terms of the lymph drainage, either because the lymph drainage is overwhelmed or because it is just failing in its own right. And when it fails in its own right, that is strictly what lymphedema is. And recent science, I say recent because uh, this is an uh, iconic reference. It's only uh, just over 10 years old. Uh, and this changed the way we thought about fluid exchange and how all forms of edema like lymphedema uh, come about. And I'm um, oh, sorry, I meant to switch that off. Um, when I was um, uh, learning about lymphatics all those years ago, textbooks taught us, and they still peddle the same uh, story today, 
that the blood comes in in the artery, travels through the uh, small blood capillaries, the arterial capillaries in red, the venous capillaries in blue, and then exit uh, in the veins. And here is where fluid is released and, and cells and proteins uh, into the tissue for the benefit of the cells in that tissue. But it was always taught that 90% of material was reabsorbed by the lymphatic and the lymph vessel, sorry, by the blood vessel. And the lymphatic um, was purely the overflow pipe and relatively unimportant and a passive structure. We now know through science that that's different. Uh, it's not uh, the, the blood basically filters fluid but it's the lymphatic that picks up all the materials from the tissue, which means if there is any swelling of a tissue, we know the lymphatic is at fault to some extent. And this is a, a very important change in our understanding of physiology and a change in the way we understand all forms of edema. So coming to primary lymphedema, uh, primary lymphedema is a chronic edema. Uh, where the fault is uh, a developmental or genetic abnormality in the structure or function of the lymphatic system. And uh, as opposed to a secondary lymphedema, as I was showing you earlier, like the breast cancer related lymphedema, where lymph glands have been removed and we have an identifiable cause. In primary lymphedema, the swelling just develops and uh, there's no obvious cause because that cause is inborn or inherent within the lymphatic system itself. And primary lymphedema can vary a lot uh, in terms of its phenotype. That means the physical characteristics that are associated with that edema. It may be a different age of onset. It may be a different site in the body. Uh, there may be different inheritance patterns, and there may be other associated features as a result of whatever the gene fault is. Now, again, harping back, one of the advantages when I'm as old as I am is, of course, I can tell you what it was like 40 years ago, but I can tell you what it was like 20 years ago. And this is how we classified primary lymphedema. We simply said it was congenital, pubertal, or late onset in life. And that's all we could say. We couldn't say anything about genetic causes, nothing about mechanisms. Um, and it was really very unsatisfactory. What's happened in the last 20 years uh, uh, through uh, groups such as ours around the world is that we've started to be more observant about the different forms of lymphedema. And by grouping them together into phenotypes, or in other words, uh, lymphedema that have very similar features, that would suggest they have the same genetic cause. And through that, we've been able to find uh, mutations and therefore the genetic cause of a number of uh, types of primary lymphedema. So that even now, never mind the future, uh, our care has changed from instead of just saying you've got congenital lymphedema, we can actually test for a gene and give the patient a very specific diagnosis if we can identify the mutation that's caused their primary lymphedema. So here in this uh, screen, we can see four, time, four types of primary lymphedema and they all look the same. So 20 years ago, we'd have probably say, you've got congenital lymphedema and there's nothing more we can do. Now we can say, oh, uh, we found uh, a mutation and this is the cause of your lymphedema. So in the bottom left-hand corner, uh, there is a condition called Turner's syndrome that has been known for some time, to be fair, and the gene is not known, but we know it's on the X chromosome. So if we look at chromosomes, then we can diagnose Turner's syndrome, but we can't exactly say what the gene is. But in these others, in the top left hand corner, Milroy disease, and many of you may have heard of Milroy's disease, we now know 
that the gene fault is in the vascular endothelial growth factor receptor three. A bit of a mouthful, but nevertheless, if someone comes into clinic with congenital uh, foot lymphedema, we will test them for this gene. And if we find a positive result, we're able to tell them all about Milroy's disease and what to expect. In the bottom right hand corner, we have a condition also inherited, uh, we call Milroy like because it's this protein, vascular endothelial growth factor uh, C, which actually activates the receptor VGFR3, and so they're linked. So that's why we get a very similar disease, but it's a different uh, mutation causing this, and this is known as Gordon's disease. And then here, we have another form of congenital lymphedema, but this is linked with microcephaly, a small head, and also with chorioretinopathy. So in other words, um, an eye problem. So that's what I mean when I say a gene fault can not only cause lymphedema, but it can cause other abnormalities unrelated to the lymph system. And that all depends on what that gene function is. So this slide alone tells us how much we've come on in 20 years in terms of being able to diagnose uh, at least the patients with primary lymphedema. Now, don't be frightened by this slide, but this is uh, a slide that we've built up slowly over 20 years. And this is our classification pathway for primary lymphedema. And so we use this when a patient comes to clinic and we ask certain questions and that then guides us to a grouping or category of primary lymphedema. And then we can perhaps test for genes. And if we do not find any genes, then we can do more research to see if we can find new genes. So what I'm going to do is walk you through this. And the groupings are largely color coded. So blue, pink, um, purple, green and yellow. So let's start how we would do in clinic. So the first question we ask, there's a lymph problem. Yes, it's primary lymphedema. Yes. And the first question is, have they got a known syndrome associated with lymphedema? A syndrome means a, a, a conglomeration of clinical abnormalities that conform to one condition. And uh, lymphedema can be part of that. It may not be the major or dominant feature. Um, but it's part of a known syndrome. And there are probably 20 plus syndromes, all of which will have genetic causes, some known, some not known, uh, associated with primary lymphedema. And two of the best known syndromes that we see quite a lot in clinic are Noonan syndrome, for which a number of gene faults are known, and Turner's syndrome that I've already mentioned to you. Noonan's doesn't come on at birth, it comes on, the lymphedema comes on later in life, despite the fact that the syndrome starts at birth. And we know that because you'll see there's web necking here, web neck, and that always indicates a failure of lymphatic development of the fetus. Um, and the Turner syndrome has it as well. So we know that these syndromes have significant abnormalities in development of the lymphatic system. And it's later in life, usually puberty, where the um, lymphedema uh, will develop, usually in the lower legs, feet, and sometimes genitalia. Turner syndrome, there is also lymphedema of the hands, as well as the feet and lower legs. Um, they, most of the other lymphatic problems that may be present at birth, I'm pleased to say, often uh, recover. Uh, and the interesting thing about Turner's is the swelling may or may not be present at birth. It can go away and come back again. And that's a real puzzle. And as I've said to you, we don't know the gene for Turner's, but we diagnose it by looking at the chromosomes and finding a missing X chromosome. So that's how we start with syndromes. If we don't recognize the patient with any particular syndrome, we then ask the question, have they got any internal abnormalities 
of their lymphatic system. And that might manifest uh, with things like fluid around the lung, fluid in the lung, fluid around the heart, uh, fluid in the abdominal cavity, something we call ascites, or it might be due to a fault in the lymphatics of the gut. And if that happens, then malabsorption occurs and the patients, generally speaking, are not able to absorb fat properly. Uh, so one example um, is this condition. This is called Hennekan syndrome, and it is basically lymphedema with intestinal lymphangiectasia. Intestinal lymphangiectasia means there's an abnormality of the lymphatics of the gut, and that means they don't absorb fat and will often malabsorb and lose proteins and give rise to abdominal pain and diarrhea. So it can be quite a problem and it needs managing in its own right. So it's an important diagnosis uh, to make. This particular um, uh, systemic form of primary lymphedema has a number of gene causes and so can be confirmed by testing for one of those uh, three mutations. But let's just have a little bit uh, closer look at the gut. Now, if you can recognize this, this is a bit of intestine. And the intestine has a mesentery, which basically drains the gut. So the lymphatics in green will drain the gut. And, uh, uh, and there's also a blood supply in red and blue. But if we come across here, this is the lining of the intestine. And within the lining, this, so this is the bowel lumen here. And this villus or projection sticks into the bowel lumen uh, in readiness to absorb the material, food, uh, nutrients, etc. So that's how we absorb things from our food. And fat is exclusively absorbed through the green lymphatic. And if that doesn't work properly, which is the case with the Hennecam syndrome, then the lymphatic just doesn't absorb the fat. Uh, the lymphatic is abnormal. It doesn't work properly. It behaves then like lymphedema. So there's a lot of fluid and swelling. And so protein and fluid then leaks from the lining of the gut into the lumen and results in abdominal pain, diarrhea, and protein level in the blood drops because there's quite excessive protein loss through the gut. And that's what intestinal lymphangiectasia does. And we manage that with a low fat diet, which is not that pleasant, but does work. We also have to make sure that the blood protein doesn't drop too low because if it does, that makes all the peripheral swelling that much worse. So that's Hennekan syndrome and just one example of a form of primary lymphedema where there is internal or what we call systemic involvement with abnormalities of lymphatics. If we've not got a syndrome and we're confident there's no internal abnormalities of lymphatics giving rise to as I've said, pleural effusions, pericardial effusions, ascites, intestinal lymphangiectasia. Then we do go to uh, a time process. We ask the question, has the primary lymphedema developed at birth or is it presenting later in birth? And I've already shown you a slide of four types of congenital uh, lymphedema including myroid disease, but let's have a little look in more detail at myroid disease, which is probably the best known of the uh, primary lymphedemas. So I've said myroid disease is due to uh, a mutation in vascular endothelial growth factor receptor three, and we would now diagnose this condition, or rather we would diagnose it hopefully clinically, but we would confirm it by doing a blood test, taking the DNA and testing for the mutation. And the one thing about knowing a mutation is you've got a very specific diagnosis. It is an absolute specific marker of a disease. 
And through that, we can then go back to the patient and study what else they might have wrong with them that uh, hitherto had not been realized. Fortunately, Milroy's disease doesn't really have many other abnormalities associated with it, uh, but we do find that they have um, some venous reflux. In other words, the valves in the veins are faulty due to the gene fault. And there are also, there's lymph fluid collecting around the testicles in the males. But this is an inherited disorder uh, with a 50-50 chance of passing it on to offspring. Now, we usually do lymphocentigraphy, which is the gold standard test for lymphedema. And here we see a normal scan. So just to walk you through this, uh, we can't see the lymph system with a camera unless we put something into the lymph system. So here we've injected a dye or what we call a radiolabel colloid, which is in black. It's taken up by the lymph vessels of the leg and taken all the way, the knees about here, to the lymph glands in the groin. And this is a normal scan. In milroy disease, we barely see anything. We don't see the lymphatic system at all in the legs. And the first question is, well, is it there? Well, the answer is, it is there, but the fault is because the dye is not being absorbed by those initial lymphatics, those bud-like or blind-ending lymph capillaries I talked about earlier. And here we're back to that picture. So the fault in Milroy appears to be the porous nature of these initial or absorbing lymphatic capillaries. And that where the fault is in Milroy. So if we take biopsies, we see these vessels, but they just don't work. And what I feel this um, uh, program of work is teaching us. So we identify the gene, we then try and find out how the gene works. And when we find out how it works, we can usually have a target for trying to uh, with a drug possibly, change the way this initial lymphatic works. We're not there yet, but I do feel confident that we will find a cure for Milroy disease where we've understood properly the molecular mechanisms that allow absorption from the tissue into these initial lymphatics. So a little on the gene. So it's a 50-50 inheritance from parent to child. Uh, the mutation can be passed on, but never expressed in terms of lymphedema. Conversely, I can see a parent in clinic where the child has myroid disease and the, the, the parent wouldn't know that they've got it until I've asked them to take their shoes and socks off and say, oh, yes, no, the skin's thicker. You've definitely got it. And then we'll test it, test the parent, find they've got the gene and they're the source for the, for the child. So there's usually a family history, but not always. Gene mutations can come out of the blue. And as I've said, the mechanism is uh, some failure of the lymphatic capillaries to absorb and transport lymph. So moving on now to a later onset form of primary lymphedema. And by later onset, I only mean after the first year in life. Um, we used to call it pubertal, and it is true to say that many forms of primary lymphedema develop around puberty, but we actually just call it late onset in terms of being more than one year old. And as you'll see from the blue, we have a number of known gene mutations for a number of forms of late onset lymphedema. So I will just tell you about one of them. And this is lymphedema dystochiasis. It is called syndrome, but we don't put it under the syndrome category because lymphedema is the dominant feature of this condition. And it's called dystochiasis because it has the patients have a second row of eyelashes. And that you might say, what's that got to do with the lymph system? It hasn't got anything to do with the lymph system. It has to be just simply another effect of the gene mutation, preventing uh, these follicles growing into grease glands. And so they get a second row of eyelashes, which dig into the, to the eye. Now, interestingly, that's present at birth, but the lymphedema in general 
doesn't come on until puberty. And the gene cause of this, and I have to be careful how I say this, is FOXY2. I used to just roll off the tongue FOXY2, and a lot of uh, listeners were under what I was talking about, this FOXY thing, this FOXY condition. So it is a FOXY2 mutation. And that causes the dystochiasis, it causes the lymphedema, and we now know that it also causes varicose veins and can cause a, a cause a cleft palate, a droopy eyelid, and sometimes some, some heart disease. And again, coming back to mechanism, because mechanisms, what interests me, because if we understand the mechanism, we have a target for uh, therapy, so we can try and develop a treatment to uh, correct the faulty mechanism. So again, on the left, we have a normal lymph scan that you've already seen. And of course, here, the lymph travels from the feet up to the lymph glands. Uh, here we have the lymphatic capillaries, the valves and the main collectors, which are pumped by the uh, smooth muscle. But in lymphedema dystochiasis, there are no valves, or at least the valves do not work properly. And consequently, on the scan, we get a characteristic picture where the lymph or the tracer goes up and then just falls back down again, filling and causing a reflux of lymph into particularly the skin and the subcutaneous tissues. And that's what causes the lymphedema. So here, if we can find a means of correcting the valve failure, we might be able to provide a cure um, for this condition. Now, I'm just going to mention one other late onset primary lymphedema because we do not know the gene for this, but it's uh, probably the most common uh, pubertal onset primary lymphedema. It mainly affects women. It's the lower limbs. There are no other associations. Here you see mother and daughter. And the fault here, this is again the normal one that you've seen before. Here, the fault seems to be a failure of the main lymphatic collecting vessels. They're the main channels going up under the skin that you're seeing in this normal scan. And because they're not working, the lymph has to find another way out and it dives deep and through the deep lymph system, it passes through the lymph glands behind the knee. So we have here a marker uh, for this Mead disease, but uh, we still don't know the gene. Now we come to our final um, grouping. And actually this is not always uh, a lymphedema. What do I mean by that? Well, there's definitely a lymph problem, but uh, the swelling may be solely related to a lymphatic malformation. What's the difference, you ask? Well, lymphedema is when lymph fluid collects in the tissue itself to cause the swelling. In a lymphatic malformation, the lymph fluid is trapped in malformed and non-draining lymph vessels. So these lymph vessels, instead of being a nice tube-like structure, um, could be uh, huge blown up balloons, uh, perhaps not draining properly and give swelling that way. So lymphatic malformations can occur without lymphedema, as you see here. So this is a malformation of the left thigh and groin region. You can see that that left thigh is swollen, but the lymph fluid is not in the tissue. There's no lymphedema lower down. The lymph fluid is trapped within these malformed or abnormal lymph vessels in the thigh. And because the lymph cannot drain properly, it often refluxes or finds its way out to the skin surface and then pops up as lymph blisters. And these lymph blisters can weep lymph, and that's characteristic of these lymphatic uh, malformations. Now, sometimes um, these malformations do interfere with the main lymph drainage channels within the limb, as is happening here. So this is a lymphatic malformation that exists throughout this leg and also the left side of the pelvis in this young girl. Uh, but as you can see, because it's interfering with lymph drainage from the foot and the lower leg, we have lymphedema as well. So this is a lymphatic malformation that we call it truncular. 
because it interferes with the main lymphatic trunks draining uh, from the uh, lower leg. Now, I mentioned this form of primary lymphedema um, because a number of mutations have been identified to cause these malformations. But what's different in the malformations is the mutation is often located only in the affected tissue itself and not widespread through the body, such as happens with Milroy's disease or lymphedema distichiasis. And we call this mutation a somatic mutation. So in this patient, for example, uh, who has a mutation in what's called the PIK3CA gene, um, there is a lymphatic malformation and lymphedema in this leg. There are also abnormalities of blood vessels, but the key is there's also an abnormality of growth in tissue. So this leg is longer. And as you can see here, uh, the foot bones have overgrown. So this is actually the big toe here, but the little toes are actually bigger than the big toe. And this is what this mutation can do. It causes overgrowth as well as lymphatic malformations. And I'm mentioning this because this is where science is now uh, creating opportunities for better treatment. And drugs are, becoming, are beginning to become available to oppose the adverse effects of these mutations. So on the left, this is all a bit small for you to read, but the point I want to make is that PIK3CA mutations um, can cause uh, lymphatic malformations. It says that down here, but the point I'm making is clinical trials have demonstrated the effect of drugs like Sirolimus uh, and Alpelisib, which uh, oppose the mutation and to some extent correct it and provide the opportunity of a drug treatment to reverse the overgrowth and hopefully reverse the lymphatic malformation and if, if possible, the lymphedema. Although it has to be said, once you've got damaged tissue, it's quite difficult to um, totally reverse it. And this on the right is another example of a different mutation uh, or mutations within a particular genetic pathway that can also cause um, uh, lymphatic malformations and lymphedema. So uh, these are there are four genes identified, and there are a different set of drugs that can uh, treat these conditions. So the exciting news is we are starting to see the development of drugs to treat primary lymphedema and lymphatic malformations. And these drugs may oppose the gene fault or might correct uh, the effects of that gene fault. In other words, the mechanism of the disease. So that's exciting. And that's where science is now beginning to make a change in terms of managing uh, primary lymphedema and lymphatic malformations. But we're not there yet. We are. It's going that way, but we still rely on the basic principle of physiological uh, stimulation of lymph drainage to treat lymphedema. So many of you uh, might be encouraged by the news of potentially new treatment, but in the main, we're not really there yet. So we still manage lymphedema uh, along the lines of stimulating lymph drainage. We often do intensive periods of treatment with compression and exercise. The exercise is essential for stimulating the lymph system because without movement and activity, the lymph system doesn't work properly. And of course, we have to use the lovely compression garments to manage uh, particularly lower limb and upper limb uh, um, lymphedema becomes more difficult, obviously, with fluid from lymph abnormalities in the chest and internally, and our time prevents me from going into that properly. Uh, and the other way of managing lymphedema is, of course, to avoid infection. I haven't said very much uh, about the important role of the lymphatic system in preventing infection, but 
uh, the lymphatic system and particularly the lymphoid organs house our immune system. And therefore, when, for example, you get an infection, uh, well, let's take COVID as an example. COVID uh, gets in through the uh, mouth, it then hits the back of the throat, and then it is taken up by the lymphatics, transported to the lymph glands, and it's there that the immunity develops to fight that infection. Same with vaccination. For vaccination to work, the uh, not the infection, but the vaccine has to be taken up by the lymphatic system, taken to the lymph glands for the right immune response. So the lymphatic system is key for fighting infection. And of course, in lymphedema, when it goes wrong, not only do you get swelling, but you get infections like cellulitis, which uh, not only uh, make you very ill, but of course uh, can make the lymphedema worse over time. So it's important to manage the infections. So <clears throat> how has science changed patient care? Well, through um, grouping forms of primary lymphedema, uh, genetic causes have been identified. Um, knowing the gene fault permits a very specific diagnosis. It can also guide genetic counselling in terms of advising the likelihood of passing on to children and how likely they are to the children to get the lymphedema. It can also inform on the natural history of that type of lymphedema. And it can also inform on the general function of that gene. For example, as I've said, FOXC2 will tell us a lot about um, uh, uh, eyelash development and particularly meibomian gland development. So it's, it informs on the physiology. And of course, knowing the gene will also provide the potential for drug therapy, such as I've alluded to with the PIK3CA inhibitors. And by informing on the mechanism of disease, it gives us a target to try and work out how we can um, correct the fault that's produced the lymphedema, such as the valve failure in uh, lymphedema dystochiasis, or the failure of the initial lymphatics to open up uh, and absorb material from the tissue. So they are quite exciting times now as science is improving patient care. So in conclusion, primary lymphedema um, is a, a, a disease of multiple gene causes and multiple clinical presentations. It's not just one condition. And if we analyze the DNA, and in about 25% of cases, we can find a gene fault and that can then guide us on uh, diagnosis and management. So back to tennis, we started with tennis, we'll finish with tennis. And I just want to tell you this story about this little lad here, patient of mine, and he's got primary lymphedema, as you can tell. And he nearly died as an infant because he's also got widespread lymphatic abnormalities, including in the chest. And his mother just adored tennis and in particular adored this man. So this young man's called Raphael after this man. So it was a real privilege to get them to meet up. And I have to say Nadal was very gracious and spent a lot of time talking to this young lad with prime lymphedema and also signed my book on Let's Talk Lymphedema, which is still available for anyone who wants to read it. And primary lymphedema is covered uh, within that. So I finish by acknowledging all the team at St. George's and Derby. We have a great team that spends, uh, concentrates very much on primary lymphedema, finding genes, understanding how the genes work. And it's through that that we are going to improve treatments in the future. And of course, our uh, funding bodies that make the uh, research possible. So on that note, I will finish, I will stop sharing, I will then answer questions. Okay, well, uh, Harvey, who's a, a great lymphomaniac like me, has asked the question, you see, how do we, how can we get 
the change in medical curricula? It's a very good question. Learn are working very hard on this, and I think you're doing a better job in the States than we are around the, the rest of the world. I think it's going to be very difficult. We have to promote the excellent science that's coming out on the lymphatics uh, in the last 20 years, and the knowledge is making lymphatics um, so important from a biological and scientific point of view, and I think we have to put, push that. So that's my answer to you, Harvey. Um, so uh, Cynthia says, in addition to exercise, what food supplements or medications help the lymphatic function better? I think, sadly, the answer is um, we don't really have anything. <laughs> It's a very simple answer. There isn't anything. Um, we believe that uh, if you're if 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 obesity is an issue, then that has to be addressed because obesity is very bad for the lymphatic system. It it undermines the functioning of the lymphatic system, both in terms of the fluid physiology and immunity. So that is the most important aspect to address. In terms of supplements, I'm not aware of anything that has any effect, uh, that proven uh, evidence, and nor do I do in, in terms of medications other than the ones I've just mentioned for specific uh, lymphatic malformations. Um, and then the only other comment would be in intestinal lymphangiectasia. There, the diet, low-fat diet, and often supplements are needed to manage that form of uh, lymphatic abnormality. So that's all I can say, uh, Sarah. Sorry, uh, sorry, uh, Cynthia, wasn't it? So um, Sarah asks, is there a certain type of specialist that tests for what kind of primary lymphedema one has? Sadly not. This is a good question. And I think in the same way that we've got um, cardiologists, then we need clinical. We don't like the term lymphology anymore. It's a bit of a tainted term, at least it is to me. So I think we need lymphovascular physicians or lymphatic physicians. Uh, and this has to be a new specialty that comes through. But I think that's only going to happen when the lymphatic system, the importance of the lymphatic system is really appreciated. And that will only come when the brilliant science that's coming through is fully appreciated from uh, by non-lymphatic scientists and clinical practitioners. Um, now, uh, so 20 syndromes are, ah, how many can be tested for, that's a good question. Um, I can't answer that one directly. You'd have to ask a geneticist this, that we have written. If you go and look at our publications, um, we have published on this. Uh, there's a big physiological review by Pierre Ostergaard, and there we've covered as many of the genes that are known to cause lymphedema as possible. So there is in the literature, but you're best to start by asking a geneticist. I, it's a lecture in itself to go through that, and I'd have to research it first. Um, so... Patricia's asked, is there a correlation between hydradenitis suppurativa and primary lymphedema? Um, for those unfamiliar, hydradenitis is a skin condition, a bit like acne that results in nasty uh, abscesses and boils in uh, sweat gland sites such as groin and armpits. And to my, it, it can cause lymphedema. But that's a secondary lymphedema. I'm unaware of any link between hydradenitis and a primary lymphedema. Okay, I hope that answers that question. Now, uh, Michael. Um, now, this, <laughs> this is a good question. I, I, I don't think I need to repeat it because you can presumably see this question. Um, and the, so is there a link between primary lymphedema and Crohn's disease? There is no evidence, Michael, that there is a link, but I believe there is. And I say this because I've seen brothers, both with primary lymphedema and both with Crohn's disease. Now, it's possible 
that they've got a mutation unknown for their lymphedema. And it's possible that Crohn's disease has a genetic basis, although we don't know the cause of Crohn's. What I will say is that science is telling us that Crohn's disease is probably lymphedema of the gut. And uh, there's quite a lot of good science coming through that shows that lymphatic abnormalities in Crohn's disease are quite prominent. That hasn't changed treatment at this stage. Um, so uh, I've got no evidence to say Crohn's disease and lymphedema of a leg would be linked, but I think there may be a biological uh, association between the two. Um, I hope that answers your question verbally as to how you get hold of the presentation. I think uh, it's going to be available on the Learn site for a while. I don't know how long. Steve, can you let us know how long is it available for? Yeah, so that'll be up in Learn Symposium Library in about a week, and that'll okay. be up indefinitely. And okay. the link is in the chat for that, for where the, the Symposium Library. Thank you. Um, so Mark asks about potential molecular treatments. Well, I referred to this in the lecture, and I've said that the mutation we know causes a fault with the absorbing ability of the lymphatic capillary. And I think more research is going to be needed before we fully understand the mechanism. We cannot give a drug to counter that gene itself because that gene is too important for other functions in the body and we might cause more problems than, than help the patient. But if we can be more specific with the molecular fault that prevents the absorption or from the lymphatic capillary absorbing material, where well, we may be able to provide a cure, but that's me being hopeful, but I do believe that will happen. Um, Patrice says, as lymph is critical to lymph absorption, is a low fat diet recommended even for other forms of lymphedema? Well, no, if there's no intestinal lymphangiectasia, then fat absorption should be normal. And there's no reason to go on a, a low fat diet. The only reason uh, for being on any diet with lymphedema, I think other than intestinal lymphangiectasia, would be if one's overweight, and I've already addressed that one. So knows the answer to that. Um, so Jenny asks, uh, what investigations do you think are most important when diagnosing lymphedema? Well, we <laughs> lymphocentigraphy is still in the UK, the standard means of investigating the lymphatic system. I mean, this is one of our problems is we don't have very <clears throat> easy, specific uh, techniques of investigation, such as ultrasound for looking at veins or echocardiograph for looking at uh, heart. We just don't have anything as clever as that. Lymphocentigraphy is still the best, but it's rather crude. There is a technique called ICG lymphography that plastic surgeons are using to identify um, lymphatic collectors that they might um, operate on. But again, it's not widely available. So I'm afraid lymphocentigraphy is still the best and should be available. I'm sorry, but it should be available. Okay. Um, so Susan, okay, <laughs> right. We need something about secondary lymphedema. So that's, that's for learn to address and for the online symposium series. There we are, a good uh, suggestion. Um, so Elizabeth says, Meek and Meek-like disease is often reported to be autosomal dominant. Um, have you seen it in cases where neither parent exhibits symptoms? Yes, and the genetics of this are as follows. Although um, the gene, strictly speaking, uh, if it's autosomal dominant, would be passed with a 50% chance of passing it from parent to offspring, um, it doesn't mean to say that that gene 
will be active and produce the lymphedema. And then sometimes it misses a generation and then can go on to the grandchild. So one sees that quite often. Um, so I have seen cases where neither parent exhibits symptoms, but one of them will have the gene. The problem is we don't know what the gene is yet, so I, I, we can't test for it. Um, so Elizabeth says, can primary lymphedema make a patient more? Well, that's a good question. I think the answer is no, unless there is widespread lymphedema. So in other words, it's all over the body and internal organs are affected as well. And then there's uh, every likelihood you would be considered immunosuppressed and uh, the characteristic cell of the lymphatic system called the lymphocyte is often low. So in theory, you would be more susceptible if you had widespread abnormalities of primary lymphedema. The good news is that I'm unaware of primary lymphedema's patients who have succumbed to COVID unless they've been very, very overweight. Uh, and so I think the immune reserve is probably better than we think it might be in patients, but you have to have extensive and widespread primary lymphedema, I think, to theoretically be more susceptible. Um, Pamela says, what's the opinion on surgery for lymphedema? Well, I think surgery, or what we call micro -lymph or lymphatic microsurgery, is a wonderful development. It's, it's added to our armory, and I think it's great that there are so many plastic surgeons and other surgeons who are uh, looking into and practicing this. However, I would say that it should be done uh, on... I mean, usually patient selection is somewhat dependent on uh, whether a working lymphatic for a lymphovenous bypass can be identified. So it depends on the type of lymphedema. It depends on the type of surgery we're talking about. And at the moment, we've got lymphovenous bypass and what's called autologous lymph node transfer, where you transfer lymph nodes from a, a, a working area of the body to uh, the drainage point for a, an affected part of the body. And what we need is more evidence uh, on uh, the effectiveness of these surgeries and it's still early days, but I'm supportive because uh, I think we need everything we can get in terms of improving treatments for lymphedema and the uh, lymphatic microsurgery has added a lot uh, to the mix as far as treatment for lymphedema patients is concerned, but there's a long way to go and a lot to learn. Uh, so uh, Maeve, um, so is there a, an age for a child presenting with primary lymphedema where defining the gene is no longer valid? and where treatment may be less effective uh, or should all newly uh, diagnosed patients be gene tested? Well, gene testing is expensive. There is no point testing for a gene unless uh, there's a reasonable clinical confidence that a gene cause will be found. For example, we test all our Milroy's. Milroy's we diagnose clinically, uh, or uh, with lymphocentigraphy, and then we would do the gene test. But if you just see any primary lymphedema that you cannot fit into a, a classification group, there is probably not much point in just running what we call the gene panel. The gene panel is the, is the testing we do at St. George's, which has all the known genes on it, and any new gene that's discovered is added to it. So we test uh, for all the genes, but it's expensive. It costs uh, about a thousand dollars, and you don't want to waste that money on a health service or a patient unless you're likely to pick up a result. So we do not test everyone. We only test those where we think there's a, a probability. 
of uh, picking up a mutation. Um, next one is, do you think lymphedema is the same as lipedema? No, I don't think it's the same at all. They're different conditions. But if you're asking the question, do I think there's a lymphatic problem with lipedema? Um, I think there might be, but we just do not know. There are several camps who think that lipedema uh, is a problem of hormone and others that think it's a fat disorder and others um, think it's a problem of obesity uh, and others that think it's a problem of, of the lymphatic system. But I don't think it's a, if, it, if lymphatics are involved, we just do not know the mechanism at the moment. So next question, uh, Keisha. Um, now, <laughs> can a groin hernia surgery at a young age cause the onset of lymphedema? The strict answer to that is no. But my rider is to say, question one, was it definitely a hernia in the first place and not a lymphatic abnormality? Because I've seen a number of patients that have been operated for hernias who've developed lymphedema. And the only way that can happen is either the, the hernia was masquerading uh, as, a, as a lymphatic abnormality or the surgeon somehow managed to damage the lymph drainage roots there. That's the only way uh, that lymphedema could develop. But groin hernia surgery should not produce lymphedema. Um, oh, Jane, thank you. Nice to hear that. That's lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Um, so moving on to the question, what is your view on lymph node transport in late onset primary lymphedema? My view is... I'd like to understand more about what it's doing. Um, I saw a patient not so very long ago who'd had it done um, by the founder of the operation, Corinne Becker, and there'd been a dramatic improvement in the lymphedema following the lymph node transfer. But six months later, the lymphedema had returned. So my question is, I am encouraging of these surgeries, but we need to stop and analyze how it's working, if it is working, and what the results are um, when compared with a sham operation or no operation or whatever. So we need a lot more. We can't just go ahead and do it blindly. We've got to learn from this process. And that's what my view is. So I'm encouraging the surgery, but we need to measure. We need to find out much more about what the surgery is doing. Uh, next question uh, is Diane. Uh, my twin daughters have lymphedema. Um, yes, I think is worth doing DNA testing. But the, again, it comes back to what I said a little earlier. Uh, I think you have to phenotype your daughters. In other words, you have to characterize them. What type of lymphedema have they got? And if it's a recognizable uh, form for which the gene is known, then certainly test them. Um, and only the children, only the daughters need testing in the first instance. That's what we do. If we find our gene panel is negative, then what we do is we go into research mode and we, we collect DNA from other members of the family and see if we can find uh, a, a common genetic fault. But we're not alone in doing this. There are a number of groups around the world that are uh, uh, very, very good at doing this. But that's how we operate. So we don't do the gene test willy-nilly. Everything depends really on the phenotype of lymphedema they have to make it worthwhile. I hope that. Um, and only then, of course, can you give it uh, an answer to the chances of offspring having lymphedema uh, if you know the phenotype and more particularly if you know the gene. Uh, 
Uh, next question, uh, going to have a knee replacement in the leg that is lymphedema. Is there anything I should know? Uh, yes, is the answer. Um, what we do is we make jolly sure we've introduced lymphedema treatment, intensive lymphedema treatment, uh, before the operation and after the operation. And the reason we do that is because a lymphedema increases the risk of problems with the knee replacement. I hope I'm not worrying you unnecessarily with this. Um, infection is the big enemy, because if a knee replacement gets infected, it's a disaster. And we believe that lymph decongestive lymphatic therapy, both before and after the knee replacement, um, and if the patient's had cellulitis before, then we give uh, covering antibiotics. So that's what you should know. Um, so next question, what's the youngest age you have used for a pneumatic pump? Well, that's a good question. Um, I don't think I've used it in anyone under 12. I don't think there's any harm. I don't think there's any particular danger, but I don't really think they're not, to my knowledge, unless they've changed the pneumatic pumps. These are the um, plastic sleeves that inflate that you put over a limb and then a series of chambers pump up, uh, inflate and deflate at different times to send a wave of compression up the leg. And uh, generally speaking, I don't think the sleeves are small enough for children, but I might be wrong on that one. So I think 12 is the youngest I've uh, used a pump. Um, next one. Um, would I share any thoughts on treatment? Well, as I've said, we've only got uh, standard um, physiological type treatment for lymphedema. In other words, um, stimulating the lymphatics as much as we can through movement, activity, exercise, and using compression to enhance that process, plus or minus many lymphatic drainage therapy, if indicated. So that's what we've got at the moment, but I'm hopeful that we will have better treatments, and I alluded to this in the talk, once we have more understanding of the molecular mechanisms that cause the malfunctioning lymphatic capillaries in Milroy's disease, for example, and then hopefully we can introduce uh, a new uh, drug or molecular treatment, but we're not there yet. Um, so next question, link between obesity and uh, lymphedema. Well, I've already answered this. Uh, weight is a real uh, problem for lymphedema. Any excess weight uh, interferes with the functioning of the lymphatic system and uh, obesity makes lymphedema, can trigger lymphedema, can make it much worse. So when we're treating anyone who is uh, obese with lymphedema, we tackle the obesity as much as we tackle the lymphedema. Uh, the link, we're not quite sure exactly what the link is. There's something about, there's a very close relationship between fat and lymphatics. So obesity and excess weight undermine the functioning of the lymphatics, but also there's a two-way dialogue here because uh, if you interfere with lymphatics, you actually deposit more fat in the tissue. Uh, that's seen, for example, in breast cancer-related lymphedema, where it's proven that half the swelling is extra fat, nothing to do with obesity, just the fact that the lymphatic system is important for mobilizing peripheral fat, a process called reverse cholesterol transport. And therefore, I, we think that mechanism has something to do with the buildup of fat when the lymph drainage fails. So there's actually a very, very interesting two-way relationship between fat and lymphatics. That's all I can say on that. Um, so Michael says, um, 
how can we get diagnosed on which type of primary lymphedema? Uh, good question. You need to find somebody in your area that majors on, on the lymphatic system. I mean, LEARN may be able to help you there by pointing you to particular specialists who could see you. Um, but I, I cannot answer that question directly, I'm afraid. Um, okay, so Kimberly said, reach out to Lucy Mackay. Okay, I'll forget about this. If someone can forward that information to me, then I will do something about it. Um, so Hansen, primary lymphedema in my left arm. I now have swelling on my right, right leg. Um, uh, no, I don't think that's true. I, Baker's cyst um, is a fluid buildup in the joint. It's usually due to arthritis, but I suspect Baker's cyst, which is bulging behind the knee, could also be related to excessive fluid in a joint, possibly related to lymphedema. So I would say that the problem was all lymphatic in origin and not due to the Baker's cyst and not due to arthritis is my guess. But please, my disclaimer here is it's professionally dangerous to make judgments without consulting with the patient properly. Um, so um, we might just do a few more. I don't know how many oh, there are. <laughs> There are more questions now than when I started. So I'm going to do another um, uh, five minutes only, if that's all right, because otherwise I'll, I'll dehydrate. Um, so genetic cause uh, meets disease. Well, I've said, I think it is definitely genetic, but we don't know the gene yet. Um, Joy asks, could hip surgery bring on disease? And by disease, I think she means lymphedema. Uh, hip surgery alone shouldn't. But if the patient, um, and I saw one only this week, who developed lymphedema of the left leg uh, after she'd had a hip replacement. And my hypothesis was the hip replacement didn't cause the lymphedema, but probably unearthed a weakness, an inborn physiological weakness of lymph drainage within that leg. And so I did lymphocentigraphy and proved I was right because we identified lymphatic abnormalities on the other side, the right leg, um, and there were lymphatic abnormalities on both legs. But the point I'm making is this patient has an underlying lymphatic abnormality that she probably would never, ever have known about if she hadn't had her hip replaced. Um, Janet uh, asks, I have lymphedema in my neck due to radiation from oral cancer. Can I move the fluids to lymph nodes that are working? Uh, yes is the answer. I mean, head and neck lymphedema, which is what, you, what happens after oral cancer, because oral cancers become much more common. The surgery is often extensive, lymph nodes are removed, and then there's radiation to follow. So it really does scupper the lymph drainage from the head and neck. The good news um, is that it, it can be treated and often can made to disperse. So there's often as much lymphedema in the mouth as there is in the subcutaneous tissues under the skin. And it's possible to move the fluid. So this is where uh, manual lymphatic drainage therapy can be extremely helpful. Um, as well as measures such as uh, particular exercises that encourage lymph movement. So hopefully if you can see me on the screen, it's about making all sorts of facial movements and also making sure that you do uh, shoulder movements, neck movements, uh, not only to loosen tissues, but to encourage um, better lymph drainage. But you're MLD or lymphedema therapist should be able to advise you on that. Um, Ethel asks, so yes, I do see progress. I think we've touched on that uh, quite enough already talking about lymphovenous bypass. Uh, 
lymph node transfer. Uh, I didn't mention liposuction, which I think can be a very useful treatment for lymphedema when the predominant component of the swelling is, is, is fat. I mentioned the breast cancer-related lymphedema in a thin patient, and there's much more fat in the swollen arm than the other arm. And if the fluid component has been treated adequately, then there may be a place for liposuction to reduce the arm further because you can't reduce fat by massage and compression. Um, so Catherine, thank you. Uh, no, sorry, Kimberly, thank you. Catherine, what is the risk of developing lymphangioma across the different types of lymphedema? I presume what you mean there is the lymph blisters on the skin surface. I mean, they often come and go. And if the lymphedema progresses, then the lymph says, I don't know where to go. So it pops up on the skin surface. So it's not unusual to get more what I call lymph blisters in certain forms of lymphedema. I think that's all I can say there without uh, knowing more uh, detail about the question. Um, oh, Jane's back again. That's twice, Jane. Goodness me. I've got two minutes left. Um, OK, so we've got lymphedema dystochiasis, but the infant being less than one years old, uh, we can identify the eyelashes. How certain is the development of lymphedema? Well, it's pretty certain throughout life, but I've seen a patient with lymphedema dystochiasis who didn't develop it until they were 50. So there we have a genetic form of lymphedema that can genuinely appear later in life. Um, I can't tell you, not all of them develop lymphedema, of course, um, but I think it was well over 50 percent of uh, the cases. You'd have to look up um, uh, Glenn Bryce's original paper from... 2002, Jane, I think, to look up that. I can't remember um, how many cases developed lymphedema there. But anyway, uh, it's not certain at all they'll develop lymphedema, but you, you need to be proactive and prepared for it. Uh, they also get bad veins, so you need to address that as well. Um, I think, don't move the, I'm going to answer this. So the last question I'm going to deal with is, Liana. So, Christine, is there any link between scleroderma and lymphedema? Um, scleroderma is an, uh, primarily an autoimmune disease that causes a thickened skin. That in itself doesn't cause lymphedema. But the reverse can be true in the sense that lymphedema can result in such thickened skin you can then develop what's called a pseudoscleroderma, and the doctor may just call it a scleroderma, but it's not the autoimmune form. So scleroderma autoimmune disease does not cause lymphedema. Roseanne, uh, <laughs> uh, Roseanne says, will I be doing one on secondary lymphedema? I don't know. It all depends what learn, uh, decide. Um, Sophia, is treatment more difficult for those who are diagnosed late in life? Um, not really. The problem as we get older is that when we treat patients, we're re relying on movement and activity. And other factors, and I know this to myself with my knees, make it more difficult to move and exercise. And you have to move and be active to stimulate your lymph system. So that's why treatment's more difficult as you get older, because mobility, activity, all those sort of things decline. And that's what makes it more difficult. Right. Last question. Liana, um, can COVID negatively impact the already? Uh, no, not to my knowledge. I mean, it. It, no, I think I'm going to say no to that. I mean, an immunologist may get clever here and say something happens, but the essence is, is no. When you recover from COVID, uh, 
I have no reason to believe that the lymphatic system permanently suffers. And at that point, if I'm allowed to, I think I might stop because I need to get a drink. Thank you all. Bye.